Sorry for the uh, delayed start. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to a CADA uh, research talk given by the director of CADA, Kevin Lake Brown, who's also a professor in computer science. He's a AAAI fellow, and he's many other things, which I won't waste his time in talking about. But it's a delight to hear what he's going to talk about, which is economics and computer science of a radio spectrum reallocation. So the application of algorithmic game theory to this critically important problem. He's worked on many other problems, things like farming and auctions for uh, crops and so on and so forth, which weren't quite in the billion dollar range, I don't think. But Kevin, it's all yours. I'm hoping you take just a little bit longer so I can finish my work. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So, uh, yeah, let me uh, begin just by having one slide on kind of what it is that I work on because um, one of the purposes of these talks is just to introduce ourselves and cater to each other. Um, so here's kind of my work at a glance with the uh, oh, laser pointer find it somewhere. Um, come on, seriously? Oh, I figured it out. Here we go. Um, so on the... Uh, x-axis here, I'm saying whether the, the project is focused kind of on, uh, I don't know if you can see that, uh, a methodology of foundations uh, kind of on the left side to kind of social impact problems on the right side. Um, and on the y-axis, I'm saying um, my kind of key technical tools. These days, pretty much everything I'm doing involves ML in some sense. So it's kind of ML plus heuristic optimization at the bottom here, ML plus game theory at the top. And they kind of blend together because uh, many game theoretic problems have a kind of optimization component to them. Um, so um, the uh, dark um, items here are things that I, I'm kind of actively working on in my group right now. And the things that are grayed out are things that I've worked on in the past but that I'm not working on actively right now. So uh, there are people in my group working on um, kind of ML plus heuristic optimization, more on the methodological side, how to configure algorithms, how to build portfolios out of them, how to use these kinds of techniques to do automatic hyperparameter and model selection in machine learning, um, deep causal reasoning, and using deep models to reason causally. Um, on the more applied side, we're thinking about things like um, using ideas from game theory to build um, peer grading systems that can be used in practice in, in real courses, and we've actually developed open source software that we use ourselves. Um, I've got a, a student working on the, the provocatively uh, titled project, How to Give Things Away, uh, How to uh, Do Socially um, um, Optimal um, Charitable Giving, or you know, if you're a sort of centralized authority trying to give things away among kind of self-interested parties that don't understand um, their relative values, how to, how to make good social choices, um, how, to, how to build behavioral game theory models, um, in part using deep learning, uh, that kind of codify ideas from cognitive psychology to understand how people actually reason strategically rather than how a bunch of uh, people in the 50s at the Rand Corporation said that we, we should think that people reason strategically. Um, and uh, Alan mentioned uh, this, this project on uh, agricultural trade in developing countries where we build an auction market that people can use, uh, subsistence farmers can use to sell surplus agriculture and you know, find it a market. Um, so, so kind of broadly speaking, this is what I care about. Um, the talk today is about this piece. So it's about um, narrowly the uh, Federal Communication Commission um, selling off radio spectrum. And, and the tools that went into that are these uh, machine learning combined with heuristic optimization, um, sort of general purpose tools that we've built that we, we applied to this problem. So, um, so enough about that. Let me tell you about the actual problem. So, the FCC ran this uh, terribly named thing. It was called the incentive auction. Uh, it's an embarrassment to all of us, but the name is in legislation, so we can't do anything about it. Um, and uh, between um, 2016 and 2017, the FCC held this uh, special purpose auction to repurpose radio spectrum that used to be used for broadcast television and, and to sell it off instead to more modern uses in, in wireless telephony. And, um, you know, essentially, in the early days of, uh, of the FCC, when they you know, were just starting to allocate spectrum licenses to different uses, they gave away some of the very best radio spectrum to broadcast television, because that was the most important thing that there was. 
Uh, so the 600 megahertz band of spectrum is really great spectrum because it penetrates um, concrete well, so you can use it to avoid dead zones in cities, and it also carries long distances, so you can use it to get coverage in rural areas. Um, and um, you know, cell phones don't get to use that spectrum because they can't, because it's being used for, for television. Uh, you know, how many people in the room today um, actually watch TV broadcast <laughs> over the air using an antenna in your house? <laughs> Okay, and you're okay. both, um, I don't it's know what's a nice way to say it, uh, over the age of 30. Okay. I think it's off it's like, I'm going to try to clean my house. That's what I asked. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I'm using There you go, yeah, yeah, I mean, sure, I mean, if you have a fiber optic, and then this wouldn't affect you, right? Because this was only about what happens over the air. This is not about changing what gets to go through the fiber optic tube into your house, which, you know, young modern trendsetters like Alice would have in their house. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but it turns out we're using up a huge chunk of this spectrum for this usage that not very many people use. Turns out maybe 10% of the American population gets their TV this way. Um, you know, maybe not the demographic that you would see in an AI talk, but, uh, but still not that many people. So, uh, so what happened is they, they decided uh, to, um, to have the auction pay people who would give up their broadcast rights. People by, I mean TV stations, to give up their broadcast rights. And then they, they took the spectrum that was cleared and they sold it. Uh, and the end effect was um, that they collected $20 billion uh, in uh, these kind of one-time payments from, um, from new users of spectrum who wanted to buy the rights to the spectrum. And then they dispersed $10 billion to the TV stations that sold their broadcast rights. Um, and they, they kept the difference. Um, much of it had to go to the kind of retuning costs, compensating people for the inconvenience of this whole process, running the process. It's a little bit complicated how all that uh, nets out, but uh, in the end, the government um, you know, netted, profited over $7 billion, which by legislation went to uh, paying down the national debt. So this was really a, a kind of win-win-win situation where uh, a social um, good, the, uh, the radio spectrum, was put to a more productive usage. Uh, TV stations uh, got a huge windfall for something they couldn't otherwise have sold uh, at such a high value, and uh, telecom companies got more spectrum that allowed them to have more viable businesses, and uh, the taxpayer uh, got a, a huge amount of debt, debt reduction that didn't result from taxation. Uh, so, so overall, pretty, uh, pretty exciting thing. Uh, it was a gigantic project. Uh, that involved, uh, even my corner of the project involved all of these people. Uh, the, the design, so I, I kind of worked on two pieces of this. I, my key collaborators on the, the market design piece were Paul Milgram and Elias Segal, who are both economists at Stanford University who led that part of the design. Um, and uh, I led the team that worked on uh, feasibility checking, which I'll tell you what it was, but this, uh, this component that has to do with uh, you know, asking a computational question about the auction. Um, let me in particular mention uh, Neil Newman, who's here. He's a PhD student of mine who was the kind of lead student on the project who actually wrote the code that was used to generate the billions of dollars for the FCC. So good thing your code worked, Neil. It would have been pretty terrible for us all if it did not. <laughs> um, and then there, there are many colleagues and, uh, and then students at UBC uh, who were involved uh, in sort of help, helping us to build tools that we used in this project. Uh, there were a whole bunch of summer students who made code contributions over the years, and there were people at the FCC and at Auctionomics, which is a private auction consulting firm that, that was involved in this work, um, who helped to con contribute to the design. So uh, I'm giving this talk, but I, I don't want to, by any stretch, give you the impression that this wasn't a gigantic team effort. Um, so let me speak first of all about this kind of market design piece. So. Um, and this first part of the talk follows a Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper that uh, Paul Ely and I wrote that, that kind of talks about just the economics of this problem. And this was an unusually free economic design process. So when uh, Hufu and I, or in our field, think about mechanism design, we usually think about a really well-stated um, question that says, you know, you've got these goods and you've got these valuations and you've got this objective function and you know, what's the best way that you can reallocate things? And in contrast, uh, the problem here um, really went beyond this choice of mechanism to say, uh, what property rights should participants in the auction even be said to have? Well, how should we define the goods that are being traded? Uh, how should we decide how many goods the, uh, the market should decide to trade? 
uh, and then uh, how should we evaluate what the market is doing? So should we try to think about a market that reallocates the goods to the most productive use? Should we think about the, the market that collects as much revenue as possible for the taxpayer? Should we try to increase competition in the downstream market, maybe by helping new entrants, uh, you know, new telecom companies that don't have very much spectrum right now that would increase competition, maybe even if that would lower revenue or, or lower efficiency? Um, and um, to what extent should we um, in, enforce that the mechanism has to be really simple? Because especially the TV stations, you know, there are thousands of TV stations, they're not really uh, all owned by big corporations. Some of them are small mom and pop operations. And the question of whether they would participate at all depended on whether they could understand what was going on. So we had all of these different outcomes we had to care about. Uh, and a theme in this talk, the you know, reason why this is an AI problem, is that computational tractability was really a first order concern for us. So um, there are lots of things that you might sort of want to do in this problem where tractability would you know, immediately just uh, kibosh the idea. So we had to constantly be weighing sort of economic interests against computational feasibility. Um, so the first question about property rights, um, turns out that the law was unclear about what property rights the broadcasters actually had. Uh, they didn't pay for these licenses when they originally got them. They were just allocated on the basis of applications back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but it became clear pretty early in the process that if the government had decided to confiscate these uh, rights, then this would have triggered a huge legal process that would have been tied up in the courts for a long time. Um, the Republicans would have been really unhappy about it. Um, it wouldn't you know, have gotten a lot of buy-in. Um, and so, so it seemed like there needed to be some kind of, you know, de facto decision that there were property rights and some kind of market-based solution here. There's a, a famous uh, argument from an economy called Coase, um, it's sort of roughly called Coase's theorem, that uh, if, if what you want is to allocate efficiently, uh, all you need is that you have clear property rights and no frictions. So you just give everybody property rights and then you say, look, sort it out amongst yourselves. You, know, you've got, you own this, this broadcast license, this other person wants it. Um, you should just trade with each other and find the, the right thing that, that would happen. Um, and you know, as long as the property rights are clear, you know what you're transferring, and you're setting with no frictions, you're just going to end up with the efficient allocation, and you don't need some kind of centralized control. So, so when I gave this talk at the University of Chicago, you know, I spent 20 minutes on this slide, because they, they say, you know, why, why is the FCC even involved in this? You should just you know, let the free market do the right thing. Uh, when you give this talk in Canada, then people are like, why are you even talking about this at all? <laughs> um, the, uh, regardless, the answer is that uh, in this setting, there, there's a really critical friction, which economists call holdout power. Um, and the problem is, um, wireless companies are not interested in buying the thing that TV stations are selling. So what TV stations can sell is the right to broadcast on a particular frequency from a particular tower uh, on a particular signal stream. And what the wireless companies want is a really large region in which they can freely um, broadcast and people can move around with their phone and they're going to not get interference anyway. And so basically a wireless company would want to stitch together a, a lot of TV stations all over the place to get something that they can really use. And um, the issue of holdout is that when you're trying to buy something from many people all at the same time and the thing that you want is only good when you get all of them, then um, one person can hold up the whole transaction and instead of demanding a price that has something to do with how much they themselves want the thing, they can demand a price that has to do with how much the transaction is worth to you. And the problem is everyone can do this. Everyone can hold you up all at the same time. There's, in a sense, there's no effective competition between these people. And so um, you can get really, really terrible pay uh, payments. So uh, for the market geeks in the room, any efficient market like VCG um, would enforce um, really high payments every channel. Uh, it wouldn't be budget balanced. Uh, we'd have really terrible um, you know, prices that were um, recommended by those kinds of mechanisms. So the way uh, to deal with this problem is by redefining property rights. Uh, and um, the uh, legislation that created this auction has a really clever redefinition of property rights. So what it says is, um, Let's not say that you have a right to, to broadcast from your channel at, uh, from your tower on your channel at your signal strength. Let's instead say you have a right to broadcast from your tower at your signal strength on some interference-free channel. So 
given that we don't have a formal definition of property rights, we're going you know, to be passing legislation that actually does that. And you know, this is, in fact, the piece of legislation that, uh, that codified this property right and, and created the auction and made the stupid name for the auction that I now have to use. Um, so the 112th Congress was apparently the least productive Congress in US history. It only passed seven bills. And one of them was this bill, which, as you can tell, is a bit of an omnibus. But among many of the things that it did, it, it was the creation of this auction. And, and what it said is um, that the FCC has the right for some station that chooses not to sell in the auction to take away the channel that it currently has and instead give it some different channel that's sort of equally good. Where we define equally good as meaning that you, you can roughly reach the same people um, broadcasting that you could reach before. And uh, in economic language, this causes stations to be made substitutes for each other and that fosters competition. Uh, so that's the answer to the first question. Um, how much spectrum should we clear? Um, the FCC decided that it would standardize the amount of spectrum um, cleared across the country. And, and every time I say the FCC decided, I mean there were conference calls and public notices and long legal processes that spanned many years, the eventual outcome of which was this decision. So you know, none of these things were easy. But, but the ultimate decision was that the amount of spectrum cleared should be the same everywhere. Uh, and they came up with these different band plans, which again were incredibly contested, but they eventually decided that you know, if we clear, so, so this shows TV channels, so channel 21, 22, 23, da, 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 da. 37 is special because it's used for radio astronomy, and they can't change all of the radio telescopes, so they have to, no matter what they do, leave 37 alone. Um, and then they need a guard band, which is unregulated spectrum that separates these two uses, which is the shaded thing. And then they would get these two uh, blue blocks that they would actually sell off, the A and B. This is the thing we'd sell. And these are the downlink bands. And then the uplink bands are over here because um, you know, sending and receiving happen in different parts of the spectrum. Um, and so whatever, that's what the band plan would look like. So if, if we're going to clear 42 megahertz of spectrum and sell it off, that's what we would sell off. We'd sell off lots A and B. And if we were going to, and that means we would end up with TV stations that went up to 43, and we'd sell off everything else, and we'd, we'd get rid of everything else. Uh, if you ever used UHF TV in the past, you know that it used to go up to 52. So we'd, we'd clear out everything from 52. Uh, on the other hand, if we cleared 126 megahertz of spectrum, we'd get rid of all TV stations above 28, and, uh, and we'd end up selling you know, A through J. And you, know, but, and you can interpolate all these other band plans. But which one should we pick? You know, when we're actually doing it, we don't really know who wants to sell, who wants to buy. How should we figure out which band plan is the one that we should actually have an auction plant? Um, the standard economic solution, maybe what you're sort of thinking in your head, is you want to find the, the quantity of trade where supply meets demand. So you know, why, is, why is that not straightforward to do here? Just look at supply, look at demand, figure out how much stuff you want to sell. Uh, the tricky thing is we don't have a homogenous good here. Right? We're, we're not talking about selling you know, units of, of sugar or something. We're, we're talking about selling uh, you know, this particular broadcast license from this tower you know, in Pennsylvania and this other thing in Florida at a different channel. And, and nothing is the same as anything else. And so uh, it, it's much harder to think about what it means for supply and demand to meet when you're not talking about one thing being sold. And I'll get back to what we did there. Um, Another thing that economists are very worried about is externalities. So economic theory says that it's best to define property rights in a way uh, that ensures that I don't care who the other winners in the auction are. Um, the incentive auction um, defined this externality, the legislation defined it, by saying um, I can assign a, a, a given station to a given channel if it doesn't cause more than minimal interference. And um, minimal interference was kind of historically by the FCC understood as meaning no more than half a percent of the population in your service area is affected by interference. So you're, you're not 100% interference free because that's kind of impossible, but you're 99.5% interference free. This is the first place where we get bitten by computational feasibility because quantifying the number of people who are affected by interference under a given assignment of channels to stations, if I consider you know, some way of reallocating everybody, um, takes absolutely days of computer time. They, they have this discrete particle simulation that a large team of people at the FCC spent many years building. It's amazing. You know, it takes into account the fact that trees you know, absorb radio spectrum, and so hills are different. And it depends whether there are trees on the hill. And it knows where the population density is. It knows all this stuff. It takes forever to run this simulation. Um, and 
it turns out there were 2,990 stations that needed uh, that, that you know, either needed to be repacked or, or would sell their their spectrum. Uh, and if we had 29 channels, which was the smallest band plant we might have thought about, that would have led to 29 to the power of 2,990. You know, 10 with 4,300 zeros after it. Possible assignments to think about. And I, I just told you thinking about any one of these assignments takes days of machine time. So that's a problem. Right, that, that seems like it's something you can say in principle, but you can't do anything in practice. Um, so something that I'm really happy that I managed to persuade the FCC to do, that the, it was touch and go there for a minute, but, uh, but we eventually uh, uh, won out here, was we redefined harmful interference in terms of pairwise constraints. So we said, a station suffers minimal interference if no other single station interferes with more than half a percent of their surface area. So it might be that in the aggregate, you get more than half a percentage of interference, because you might get different interference from different people. But, but every individual person, every individual station doesn't interfere with you more than a little bit. Um, why is that good? That means I can make these pairwise constraints offline. I can say, what are all of the different worlds where you know, our station can be on one channel, and I can be on another, and he causes me bad interference. And that means that pair of things is not allowed to happen. And, and that's all I need to think about. I don't need to think about what the rest of you all do. And I can you know, likewise do that for all the pairs. That took many months of computer time to actually grind out all of those pairwise constraints, but they did it once and then we had them. Um, but, you know, so now I've got a CSP, but it's, you know, I'm still not in a wonderful state of the world when I've got a CSP, because the problem of determining whether there exists any channel assignment uh, is still a graph coloring problem. I still have to look uh, you know, it's a graph coloring problem where, where there's a node for every station, there's an edge for every, uh, every place that an interference constraint might exist, and there's a color for every channel that I could take. So I've got a, I'm asking, you know, can I 29 color this 3,000 node graph uh, in order to say, is there some way of repacking these stations? Um, and, you know, this is, uh, I think, the more convincing answer to, to Coase, uh, to the economists. The economists really don't like this answer, but I find it very convincing. Um, which is, I can't expect a decentralized process to just by itself do the right thing here, because that would mean that it was in a decentralized way solving an NP-complete problem tractably. And if, I, if my computer can't do it, there's no reason to think that the market can just somehow by itself do it. There, you know, it doesn't even have the benefit of all the centralized information that my algorithm has. Um, you know, if, it could, if it could reliably always do this, that would sort of mean that the market was you know, a computer that could always solve NP-complete problems. You know, we should use it to break cryptography. Um, so, so there's a role for, for a centralized authority here uh, to, to better attack these problems. So, so here's um, the, the market design that we ended up uh, adopting. So there was a forward sending price option for the telecom firms that, that bought these ABCDE licenses. Um, this looked similar to uh, what had been done in radio spectrum auctions in the past. Um, you know, there have been many radio spectrum auctions uh, over the last kind of couple of decades, uh, and they've tended to look like this. The, the novel ingredient in this auction is this is the first one where the spectrum was being simultaneously bought back from another use and resold all at the same time. Um, so we didn't really innovate in the forward auction. You know, have, you know ascending prices, and you know, prices keep going up as long as uh, there's more demand for the licenses than there are licenses. But then we have this reverse auction for broadcasters where we offer people prices for their stations and we, we ask, is it the case that I can repack everybody who remains into the amount of spectrum that I'm trying to fit? And prices that I'm offering for stations keep decreasing as long as it's the case that I can still accommodate everybody because I'm sort of buying more spectrum than I need. So I keep lowering the prices at which I buy. Um, and when these two options terminate, I, I, so I do this for some amount of spectrum that I might clear. I initially do it for the biggest amount of spectrum that I might try to clear. And then if I've met my revenue target, if I'm paying less to clear the spectrum than I am to, then I'm collecting revenue to resell the spectrum, then I declare victory. Um, and if not, I shrink the amount of spectrum that I'm trying to clear, which means I'm going to have to pay less to clear it. And I keep shrinking until I eventually have the thing work out. Um, and actually, as it turns out, we, we iterated through this process four times in the real auction. Um, we ended up clearing 84 megahertz of spectrum in the, in the final auction. So, so let me show you uh, how this reverse auction works by giving you an example of airline overbooking. So um, this is kind of a hypothetical example, but I think the reverse auction is really hard to think about. So I think this um, makes it a bit more intuitive. So let's imagine a sort of fictitious abstraction of airline overbooking where 
Um, you're not allowed to be bumped uh, out of economy into business class. You have to fly in your ticketed cabin, um, just because that's going to work for our example. Um, and uh, so the feasibility constraint the airline is going to have is the number of people in each cabin has to be less than or equal to the number of seats in that cabin. Uh, as long as they, they have more people who think they're getting on the plane than they have seats, you know, they're going to have to you know, drag some guy off and break his teeth. Uh, true story. <laughs> um, so you know, we don't want that. So they have to meet the feasibility constraint. And, and I'm going to use the, the same auction that we use in the reverse auction in, in this setting to illustrate how it works. So you know, the way it works is you start out with a play with multiple classes of service. Let's say we've got first class, business class, and economy class. You've got everyone assigned to seats. Everything looks good. But then, of course, you know, this is United Airlines, which I hate. And United Airlines says, we, we can't help you notice we have all these empty seats. Big planes are really expensive to operate. Let's swap it for a smaller plane. And all of a sudden, now we've got a problem. We've got uh, more people than we have seats. Um, so this is infeasible. But let me offer everybody something to not fly. You know, what if I give you the first flight tomorrow instead of this flight today? Um, and I'll also pay you $1,000. Would you be willing to get off, uh, get off the plane? And some of the people say, you know, no, under no circumstances would I not take this flight. But some of the people say, sure, $1,000 sounds pretty good to me. And they get off the plane, and I've met my feasibility constraint. So this is where the auction begins, where I offer, offer people something, um, and, and I start out in a feasible place. So now United Airlines, being you know, my nemesis, says, well, you know, how, I, I sold you a ticket to a plane, and it wasn't a real ticket. You just keep falling for my lies again and again. Why did you think I really meant it when I said $1,000? I didn't really mean it. How do you feel about $800? And some of these people say, you know, curse you, United Airlines. I'm getting back on the plane. Um, and other people say, eh, you know, I, I hate being lied to, but $800 is still $800. I guess I'll stay off the plane. Um, now, first class here in this example has just filled up, right? We now have no more empty seats in first class. And I've got three first class passengers that are off the plane. And they've accepted an offer for $800. Uh, at this point, I've got to pay those guys $800, right? Because there's, uh, there's nothing else I can do with them. But I still have empty seats in the other classes. And so those guys are going to still uh, face increasing, uh, you know, more decreasing offers. So I say to these guys, how do you feel about $600? And some of them get back on the plane. And I say, all right, what about $500? Some more of them get on the plane. And now I've come up with a price for business class. And business class is not getting paid less than first class because business class is less good than first class. It's getting paid less because the other people in business class were willing to accept the lower prices to, to be taken off the plane. So this price is being set by the market. It's not being set by the good. Um, and the economy class people, you know, obviously they're suckers. They'll, they'll do anything for a bag of free peanuts and uh, you know, which has to sit by the window. So, you know, so I offer them $400, and some of them get on, and $300, and some of them get on, and these poor suckers get $250. Finally, I pack them in like cattle, and, and these remaining people, I have to, uh, I have to pay them their, their grubby little $250 to stay off the plane. So, so that's how, how the auction works. Yeah. I've never seen it. It always goes the other way, in my experience, where they start, they'll offer you $200 and raise it to $400 or $600. Sure. Well, this is a this is a reverse auction, I and mean, you can have a forward auction. Do they actually do this? Um, actually, um, well, not exactly. This this is actually a novel auction design that was invented right. in the context of the FCC auction <laughs> and, you know, by the team of people I worked with. So, right. um, no, I, as far as I know, it's been used exactly in this one place. Um, there's some discussion of using it in other places, but it's really like brand new. And uh, just published in the like, Journal of Economic Theory like a year ago. Um, and does it depend on having multiple classes of service, or it works should work without that? So it doesn't really have anything to do with classes of service. So it really has to do with just being different things. Yeah. So, so you know, in this analogy, I talked about classes of service to make it appealing. But you should think of this as being different regions of the country. And you know, why is it? I, I'll get to you in a second. But you know, why is it that New York uh, ends up with higher prices than LA? It's not because New York is better. It's because the other stations won't stop broadcasting at low prices. Yeah. You're sort of assuming that the the passengers are independent of each other. They don't sort of. That's very all important. people yeah. go. Don't move across at once. Uh, correct, um, but it, that, that's you know, relatively true in our example because these are you know, TV broadcasters, each of whom has an antenna in a particular place. You know, one of my options is not you know screw you guys, I'm taking my antenna in New York and moving it to Nebraska, or, or maybe more likely the other direction. Uh, you know, all I've got the rights to do is to broadcast from this particular place, so I'm really anchored in in place. Uh, that's that, that's why I didn't have people changing classes of service in the example. Um, so, the, so think of it as places, 
But the feasibility constraint is not the uniform major weight feasibility constraint that I just described to you that said the number of people is less than the number of seats. The feasibility constraint is the graph color constraint that's induced by this interference graph on the entire country that came out of this crazy discrete particle simulation. So, so this is the real graph um, as visualized by Neil. It doesn't do justice to just how awful the dense parts are, um, which is really awful, I think. Um, I, I recall that there are nodes in the New York area that have like 190 neighbors in the graph, something like. So there are some really terribly congested places. Of course, we're trying to like 29, 30, 40 color this graph, right? But um, really, really highly connected graph. Um, and what that means is the prices for adjacent things could, could be different. You know, even if places are very close together, they can freeze. They can you know, get locked into a price at different times based on the kind of topology of this graph. Um, so, so here's how the auction had to work, right? So when I'm kind of going round robin and deciding for everybody whether I can lower their price again or whether I've got to fix their price because there are no more seats left for them on the plane, that really means solving that graph coloring problem for every price movement for every bidder in the auction. And I've told you there are potentially 2,990 bidders in the auction, and every price movement for every one of those bidders is going to involve solving an NP-complete problem. Um, now, what happens uh, if I can't solve this problem? Um, is that actually here? Yeah. Um, what happens if I can't solve this problem? Um, <clears throat> turns out that something really nice about this problem, the economics of this problem, if I can't solve the problem, the world doesn't end, right? If I, if I can't decide whether it's feasible or not, I can just declare that it's not feasible. And all that happens is that I might pay somebody too much. That doesn't turn out to hurt the incentives in the auction. I still give people dominant strategies in the auction. Um, but it does mean that I pay too much. Um, I, I really don't ever want to claim that a problem was feasible when I didn't solve it because that might mean that I commit myself to some plan where I'm packing more people on the air than can actually go on the air and the world ends and terrible things happen. So we have to be super careful about not mistakenly claiming feasibility. But if we act, you know, sometimes can't figure it out and just call that infeasibility once in a while, uh, things degrade kind of gracefully in that sense. Um, as an aside, you know, there's a whole AI literature around market design that thinks about these NP-complete problems in market design. I'm not aware of another mechanism that has this kind of graceful degradation to occasionally failing to solve um, hard optimization problems. I think that, that made this design really cool. Um, but the problems were enormous. Um, I ran by the FCC's lawyers this language about initial skepticism of whether the problem could be solved at a national scale. Let's just say that understates it. Um, they were uh, dubious that we were going to be able to make this work. Um, and we did using um, some ideas that we called deep optimization, and which I guess now I'm sort of transitioning to a second paper, which uh, and Neil is the first author on, and this is a, a, a communications of the ACRM paper. Um, so um, so we, you know, our task was to build a feasibility tester, build a piece of software that could repeatedly make a decision about whether some repacking was possible some way of sticking all the stations back on the plane was going to be possible to do. Um, originally, we did this by studying a bunch of proprietary data from the FCC. Um, we were under the impression at the time that this data was going to be uh, possible for us to disclose publicly, but it turned out that it wasn't. Uh, and so Neil very heroically wrote an entire reverse auction simulator that we could use to generate uh, meaningful synthetic data of entire auction trajectories, which we could then evaluate this stuff on. So all of the results that I'm going to describe here uh, are synthetic data based on this reverse auction simulator that uh, the Neil wrote. And it's all public data that you can have access to. Um, the assumptions of the simulation are 84 megahertz clearing target, which is the amount of uh, spectrum that was in fact cleared in the auction. Um, there's a valuation model um, due to uh, a bunch of people who studied this problem in the literature, study exactly this specific problem of these stations. Um, our, our behavioral assumption is that stations participated when their product value for continuing to broadcast exceeded uh, and um, uh, was less than the price they were offered. And we give a minute to the feasibility check. So we simulated 20 auctions, which corresponded to 60,000 instances. Um, and these were all instances that were not directly solvable by augmenting the previous solution. So something you'll notice is that each feasibility checking problem, each question of can I stick this next guy on the plane, differs by one person from a problem that I previously solved, because I'm sort of doing these things in a chain. So I always have a solution for the previous, how did I find ways of putting everybody on the plane for the previous one, and now I say, you know, what if David comes along and I have to also put him on the plane? 
because the constraints are crazy, that's not necessarily easy to do. A lot of people might have to move their seats to accommodate the fact that David is there, but there's only one different person. <coughs> so one very easy heuristic I could do is say, what if I just stick everyone in the seats they were in before and see if I can find a seat for David? Um, and those problems are super easy to solve. But of course, if that doesn't work, that doesn't mean the answer is no, I can't do it. It just means it's harder. So, um, so we throw out all of those instances. We don't even consider those. So it turns out that 97% of problems in practice are easy problems of that kind. And so we studied what to do with the remaining 3%. Um, you might think, hey, you're already at 97%. That's pretty good. Maybe you didn't even need to do anything. Uh, at the very end of this, I'll tell you some economic analysis we did using the auction simulator that shows that we really did not that that 3% mattered a lot. Um, so the first thing we tried is um, when we uh, kind of came to the table, the FCC was thinking about this problem using a mixed integer programming formulation. Um, I'm not allowed to say exactly what they were doing, um, but I can say that the two um, best mixed integer programming solvers that kind of everyone uses are Cplex and Garobi. And we tested just running them kind of up, out of the box on these, um, the, the 60,000 hard instances. Um, and uh, here's what we found. So, so let me show you how to read these graphs, because I'm going to show you a succession of graphs that are all kind of looking the same. Um, so on the uh, x-axis here, I'm showing you runtime on a log scale. And on the y-axis, I'm showing you the fraction of instances that our solver is able to solve within that amount of time. So this is an empirical cumulative density function. Uh, the best stretch distribution would look like this. It would be like, you solved all of them right away, and now I'm flat. Uh, the worst stretch one would look like this. You know, I'm solving nothing until the one minute cutoff. Sorry, I didn't solve it. Um, and you can see that uh, that's a pretty good first order approximation to what Cplex is doing. Um, Cplex is solving only about, uh, what, 15% uh, of the instances within a minute. And uh, Garobi is doing better than that. It's solving a little bit more than a third. Um, but still um, not spectacular. This, this is not good enough performance to run an auction. The FCC would not have proceeded with solvents that, that were um, as weak as this. So the first thing that we did was to say, you know, it doesn't seem to us that mixed integer programming is a really good model for the problem that you're facing here because you don't have an objective function that you're trying to optimize and you don't have real valued constraints. You have this purely combinatorial optimization problem and you want to ask a feasibility question about it you know, this sounds to us much more like a satisfiability problem, and you know, we turn out to uh, be um, partial to satisfiability, so you know, why don't you try some satisfiability solvers? And, and furthermore, the SAT community makes its stuff available open source. There's a gigantic community of open source SAT solvers out there. What if you just ran that stuff? So we downloaded everything, and we ran it all, and by we, I mean Neil. I didn't run any of it. Um, and, uh, in fact, there were, I think, two or three times as many solvers as show up on this graph, but these are the best ones. Um, and you can see they're doing a whole lot better. Um, Cplex and Garobi are still here in dashed lines. And um, some of them are you know, pretty great, like G Novelty Plus PCL up here you know, is solving uh, almost 80% of the problems um, in, in a minute. That's pretty good. Um, some of them are you know, a bit less good. This one here. Um, Savenstein turns out to be a solver that our group wrote, um, and uh, you know, it does okay for the first sort of second, and then it just uh, stagnates and, and gets nowhere. Um, but you know, still not, not bad. So it's still not good enough to, to run an auction. We're still not content with having 20% you know, of the problems unsolved after a minute, but, but it sure looked like SAT was a good way to go. Um, never mind that. Um, so, so now I want to tell you some ideas about how we can get beyond this. If I, if I want to exceed this kind of performance, what might I do? And I want to tell you about this idea that we call deep optimization. So um, no AI talk uh, is complete without a picture of Moore's Law. So here's my picture of Moore's Law. Um, why do we want to show you a picture of Moore's Law? Because um, it, it's important to remember uh, that things that you can do with computers today Things that make sense to do might have seemed crazy only a short time ago because of, of this continued exponential growth in computing. And the reason we need to be reminded of this exponential growth in computing is that our experience of computing is this uh, cyan line here. This is the clock speed of the computer that sits on your desk. And um, you, you know, it, it might feel to you that your computer hasn't really gotten faster since about 2000. And that turns out to be true. Your computer really kind of hasn't gotten faster since about 2000 because uh, physical limits and heat limits have, have kind of topped us out around uh, 
uh, the same sorts of clock speeds that we were experiencing you know, in the mid 2000s. Um, instead, the, uh, but, but you know, Moore's law really was always about this navy blue line, which is the number of transistors on a chip. And the number of transistors on a chip has been marching on unabated. Um, you know, it will also eventually at some point um, not continue growing exponentially forever. But over this period of time, when we feel like everything is kind of flatlined, we've seen a really phenomenal increase in the number of transistors that you can buy. And uh, this has mostly been uh, realized in terms of increasing parallelism. So we have access to vastly more parallelism today than we did uh, you know, back in the day. And uh, the question is, how can we use this crazy amount of cheap parallelism that we now have access to to do kinds of reasoning that we just couldn't really have thought of doing before? Um, so why do I use this phrase, deep optimization? I mean, obviously, in some sense, because if you stick deep in front of something, it sounds so much cooler than you don't. Um, but, but I, I, more or uh, less tongue-in-cheek, I want to claim that there's really a, a, a meaningful analog between deep learning you know, as it relates to classical machine learning and deep optimization as it relates to classical optimization. So, um, so let me caricature you know, what is classical machine learning and how does it differ from deep learning. Classical machine learning said, let's come up with a set of features based on expert insight. Let me tune a model family by hand. You know, let me go to NIPS and find out you know, which is the cool model family this year. You know, okay, I need to use support vector machines. Oh, it's got uh, hyperparameters in the kernel. Let me maybe tune those hyperparameters with some little local testing, and, and you know, then that's my model. Deep learning says, let me throw most of this so-called expert knowledge out the window. Uh, let me take very highly parameterized models, uh, which use expert knowledge kind of only for identifying appropriate invariances and model biases, things like convolutional structure. Uh, and these models are deep in the sense that they contain many layers of these parameters, each of which depends on the previous layer. Uh, then I'm going to use lots of data to avoid overfitting these things. I've got a lot of parameters, which is dangerous uh, because I can easily just kind of fit my data, and my solution to that is going to be to have a lot of data. Um, also some ideas about regularization, but I think that the main way we attack this is just by having huge amounts of data. Um, and then how do I optimize this crazy thing where I've got you know, gigantic amounts of data, gigantic numbers of parameters, I have to somehow fit this model? The answer is I pretty much brute force it. This is where I use Moore's Law. I just uh, stick the thing on a GPU, I use the cast of gradient descent, and I, I just grind it out. I, I you know, spend days running on a supercomputer, and I eventually figure out some good model. Um, so now let's think about how optimization is classically done. Um, typically, you know, an expert thinks really hard about some combinatorial optimization problem, and they come up with a heuristic algorithm. And then they iteratively conduct small experiments. They, you know, they, they see how the experiment worked out. They see which kinds of problems were hard for the algorithm. They reason about which heuristic might be good for, for addressing that kind of failure mode. And they iterate, and they run more small experiments. And they kind of keep doing this until they get to the AAAI deadline at which point they lock in their design and they ship it off and that's a paper. Uh, so I would like for that to stop being a paper. I would like for that instead to be something that a computer does for you. And, and that's sort of the notion of deep optimization. So, so what I would like to say is let me express a very highly parameterized algorithm as a combinatorial space of design options that are all the kind of things that I might think of doing. Uh, and let me think of those as parameters so of design elements of an algorithm that might make sense to an expert. And I want this parameter space to be deep in the sense that I want to have many parameters that depend on the values that the previous layers of parameters took. And I'll talk about how we instantiated that deep parameter space in our application. And then I want to take lots of data that I'll use to characterize the distribution of interest that I care about. I mean, I'm trying to fit something here. I'm trying to find an algorithm, in my case, that has good performance on the United States interference graph. I don't care if this thing has terrible performance on the India or China interference graph. I could just build a new algorithm for them if they ever come to me. But what I want is something that works specifically on this distribution of problems. I also don't care about problems where New York City is cheap and Iowa is expensive, because that never happens in my simulations. And that happens you know, for good reason. I know that these stations are going to exit before these other stations exit. So I have all of this kind of probabilistic information encoded in, my, uh, in the data that I'm given. And I, I want to do well on average on that data. And then, um, then I somehow have to do search over this space of crazy parameters, each of which corresponds to a heuristic algorithm that I have to evaluate on this giant set of data. And that sounds pretty hard. Um, and it is, and we have to do you know, some clever things to make that actually feasible. 
But at a first order level, really the way we deal with that is we grind it out. We just say, I'm going to put this on a giant computer cluster. I'm going to you know, replace human intuition with a humongous amount of computation. And, and that's pretty much what we do. Um, so I said a little bit of cleverness is required. We need to build something called an algorithm configuration method, um, which is um, some kind of algorithm that takes other algorithms as input. Um, it takes a parameterized algorithm as an input, and it basically conducts an automatic experiment design on this algorithm to try to figure out you know, where are good places in this algorithm's design space. Um, in particular, we use something called sequential model-based algorithm configuration, or SMAC, that came out of our group. Uh, it's a so-called Bayesian optimization algorithm. The way it works is, uh, again, it uses machine learning. So uh, we, we observe the algorithm's performance at various points in the parameter space, then we fit a response surface model, a Bayesian response surface model, to the parameter space, trying to predict performance as a function of the parameters. And it's a Bayesian model, which means that it makes uncertainty estimates at every point in the space. So not only can it tell me, you know, here's how good I think the model is in this place, it also says, here's how uncertain my estimate of how good the algorithm was at this point in the space. Um, and then we have some kind of acquisition function that says, where should I do an experiment next? And the acquisition function can be something like, I want to find a place that is a nice trade-off between being predicted to be good and being predicted to be uncertain. That's a place where it's worth it to gather more data. And then I'll go and actually do an algorithm run in that point in the space, and I'll find out how it actually performed. And if it's terrible, I'll update my model, and that will stop looking like a good place to experiment. And I'll kind of keep iterating in this way over a long period of time on a computer cluster, and eventually I'll, I'll explore this space and find, find algorithms that perform well. So we could do this to all of the different solvers uh, in, in that huge benchmark. It turns out the benchmark that Neil did this run on was a competition that Holger Hoos and Frank Hutter and I and a couple of others uh, organized a few years ago, asking SAT solver authors to submit solvers uh, along with a configuration space. And we would then configure the solver for them. And the winner of the competition would not be the person with the best default performance, but the bed, it would instead be the best configured performance. So we were encouraging people to think explicitly about providing these design spaces as part of authoring an algorithm. And as a nice side effect, we got a ton of algorithm design spaces that we could use in other work. Um, so we configured everybody. And it turns out that Sattenstein, this algorithm of ours that I was making fun of before because it stagnated, actually turned out to be the best algorithm. Um, and, and the reason is, Sattenstein was designed on purpose to have a really enormous design space. It was designed to work with this kind of deep optimization methodology. It was never designed to have a good default. It was instead designed to express basically all of the good ideas from the local search um, SAT solver literature um, so that it would uh, you know, express a really wide range of choices that could be picked up by this kind of optimization approach. And uh, happily, uh, it did pretty well here. Uh, then we did a whole bunch of other problems. We identified a bunch of other problems Excuse specifically. Me. I didn't see that. Could you go back? Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Here. It's still low, still no, sorry. So this was Sattenstein that I showed you before in its default configuration. Okay. This was the and best the, thing that I showed sorry. you on the SAT graph Got before it. I just dropped Got everybody else. Got it. And uh, yeah, this is the new one, right? So uh, that is uh, that, that's a happier looking graph. But we're still not quite happy. You know, we're still at like 92 percent. We still want more. Pretty yeah. Good. So the same problems, the same instance, hard instances, hard for all algorithms. Why did you choose one algorithm <clears throat> as opposed to having? I'm getting there. Oh. But good question. Such a good question that I have an answer to it on a subsequent slide. And so, so then we thought about you know, various ways that we could leverage what we knew about this actual problem to, to do better. And one thing I mentioned before is that all of these problems ask whether it's feasible to add one station to an existing set that I already knew was feasible. So maybe there are ways that I can leverage that. Maybe I can say, uh, let me initialize a local search of the known solution and see whether there's something in the neighborhood of the known solution that's good. Maybe that would be helpful. Or um, maybe um, there's something I can do for incomplete solvers. I want to explain what it is. Uh, we came up with, I think, a very beautiful idea for thinking about how to, how to cache partial results from, um, from one CSP to another related CSP, which if I had sort of five minutes to talk just about that, I would tell you what the idea is. Um, but, uh, but we implemented this very complicated caching scheme um, that, that basically looks for um, supersets that, uh, of, of the set of stations that we now face a repacking problem on that we, could, um, that we already know a solution to. Um, the, the idea of caching was exciting is because we could do a lot of offline computation and actually see if we could build a cache 
uh, offline that we could actually use online because we knew the graph in advance. Um, we looked for uh, graph de decomposition ideas. You know, if, if I could decompose the graph into a bunch of unrelated, uh, unconnected graphs, I can solve each of these things separately and in parallel. But on the other hand, I have to spend some time looking for a decomposition. It might not be worth it. <coughs> and we can look for under-constrained stations. Stations that basically, no matter how I set all the other stations, it's always going to be possible to find a value for this station. And I can just take them out of the problem to make the problem smaller. Uh, again, that takes some effort to identify those stations, but it makes the problem easier. It's not clear whether the trade-off is worth it. So we have all these things where we're not sure if the trade-off is worth it, and so we made all of these other things into more parameters. So we added these as sort of algorithm agnostic parameters uh, that, again, we could use deep optimization to address. So we now effectively have an algorithm with this large and deep parameter space. The highest level parameter is should I run a complete solver or a local search solver, and then which solver, and then which parameters for that solver, because all the solvers have many parameters, and, and they often had many layers of conditional subparameters that, you know, should I do random restarts, and if so, with what probability, and, you know, if I restart, should it be a local restart or a global restart, you know, so they can be nested quite deeply even within an algorithm. Um, which solvers um, do we look at? Uh, we looked at uh, one local search solver and one complete solver. Uh, we used a small set of solvers because uh, for software engineering reasons, we didn't want to have to ver verify the correctness of too many different code bases. The FCC actually had to you know, do security checking and you know, verify correctness, make sure things weren't going to crash. And so um, we, we kept ourselves to two code bases. CLASP uh, is um, a, a solver from uh, Torsten Schaub's group in, uh, I think, Germany. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was the, the solver, it, it was designed to have a really big parameter space, um, again, for use with this kind of deep optimization approach. Um, and uh, Satinstein, I already told you about, it was this solver that, that we made in some, some previous work here at UBC, again, with the uh, intention of being able to instantiate lots of different interesting solvers. And we actually extended Satinstein a little bit for the FCC project to add in some solvers that we knew were really useful. Um, so those were, um, so that was a parameter, should it be class per Satinstein? And then we added these problem-specific speedups as parameters, and we put in some other generic speedups that I didn't mention that are applicable kind of always. Uh, one of them was um, doing R consistency, which is a, a classical idea um, whose author is lost to history. Uh, actually, it's Alan. Um, and, uh, you know, which side encoding we actually used. Turns out there were multiple side encodings we could use, and that was a sort of cross-cutting algorithm agnostic parameter. So we, we put all this crazy stuff in. Um, but what about David's question? You know, all of this would just instantiate one algorithm. Maybe we shouldn't be content to only identify one algorithm. Again, we have this embarrassing parallelism. What if we wanted to run more than one algorithm? Turns out this, again, is something that we've uh, done a lot of research on here at UBC. This is an idea we call algorithm portfolios. And it leverages the fact that for uh, NP-complete problems, there's not really one best algorithm for a given distribution. There are typically many solvers that, that do well on different parts of a problem distribution. And just as when you have financial securities that do well in different economic conditions, it can be good to hold a stock portfolio. And when you have algorithms that do well on different problems, it can be good to have an algorithm portfolio. And um, so Satzilla, which is uh, pictorially represented here, uh, is an algorithm portfolio that my group uh, invented sort of starting in 2003 and kind of working until the present, which uses machine learning on a per instance basis to predict which algorithm it should run. Uh, and it's done very well in SAT competitions over the years until eventually it got banned from participation in SAT competitions <laughs> because it was doing so well that other people were embarrassed at how well it did. Um, that's sad but true. Um, and uh, you can do that, but if you have enough parallelism at your disposal, you don't even have to do that. You can just t say, I'm going to have eight things in the portfolio, I'm going to run them all at the same time, and I don't care about the fact that that uses eight times as much computation as I don't care. Uh, and then whichever one finishes first, that's the best one. Um, that's even better than what the sense of approach if you don't care about the extra computation. So, so that's what we did here. So let's say I, I'm willing to run eight things in parallel. How should I decide which eight? I've got this gigantic parameter space. Um, how do I identify eight uncorrelated things that together are going to constitute the best um, algorithm portfolio? Um, turns out, you know, once again, we have a, a paper written here at UBC that, that asks this question. And we have this method called Hydra, which, which automatically comes up with a portfolio from some really enormous design space. 
Uh, and the idea is um, we sort of leverage the fact that this is a submodular optimization problem, where we want to say um, you know, the, the marginal value that I get of adding something to the portfolio uh, each time I add another thing is decreasing. Um, and so a greedy algorithm is going to give me a good approximation to uh, the best portfolio. And the greedy algorithm that I use here is to say, let me say what is the best single algorithm that I can make by running my algorithm configurator on the whole distribution, and I build a portfolio of one thing. Then I say, what is the best portfolio of two things that I can make, holding constant the first thing that I already made? And let me configure a second time, where I change nothing but the objective function that I give the algorithm configurator. Instead of asking for the best runtime possible, I ask for the best marginal improvement, the marginal runtime, um, basically the best portfolio runtime. So, so I, I don't care if I come up with something that has really bad performance on some instances, if those instances get instead given to the first thing that I made. Uh, so, so I'm going to score every run um, by the portfolio's runtime. That, that effectively scores algorithms by their, their marginal contribution to the existing portfolio. Um, and we just iteratively optimize this metric um, given this huge parameter design space that I mentioned, and we produced uh, eight solvers in this way. And uh, you know, I'm not going to walk you through what they were, but you see some of them are satin steins and some of them are clasps. Some of them um, you know, use AC3 and some of them don't. Some of them use the pre-solver ideas that I told you about and some of them don't. They use different SAT uh, formulations. So they just blended together all of these different ingredients that I told you about before. And we didn't think about what was going to work. We just you know, ran this thing and this is what fell out. Uh, and you can see you know, how well do we do in terms of solved percentage and in terms of wall clock time um, as we go from a portfolio of size 1 to a portfolio of size 8. Um, and you know, we, if you think of this in terms of, you know, there's seven percent of instances I couldn't solve versus there were four percent of instances that I couldn't solve. You know, we close the gap by you know, almost half by by this portfolio approach. So putting it all together, um, here's what we eventually got. So here's the um, this is uh, the solver that we made called SATFC, uh, running as a portfolio of eight solvers, uh, and then the graph, uh, the other breakdown just showed the different elements of the portfolio. And what I want you to see is that some of the things in the portfolio are really awful. Right? These are solvers that if I saw them by themselves, I would think that's terrible. I would never want that solver. But it's a good thing to run in parallel because every once in a while it's fast on a problem that nobody else is fast on. And so even though it's slow most of the time, its marginal value to the portfolio is better than anything else that we can find. Uh, and that's a really interesting way of thinking about algorithm design because typically you, know, you can never publish a paper on this, this idea even if it was a really uncorrelated great idea. Um, so actually, our, our group has done some work on how, how to incentivize people through the design of algorithm competitions to produce things like that that are actually novel and interesting and uncorrelated, even if they're really terrible on average. Um, okay, so, so this is sort of the end of the part where I talk about you know, how good was the um, SAT solver, how do we eventually build a SAT solver that was fast, and I'm almost done. But the last thing I'd like to tell you about is, um, did this make any difference to the auction? You know, so I, I managed you know, for the last 20 minutes to sort of put you into this alternate reality where we care about how fast the SAT solver is. But you know, why should I care about how fast the SAT solver is? Did, did it actually repack radio spectrum in a better way? That's the question that we now want to think about. Uh, and we can do that because Neil um, you know, is not happy about it, but he turns out to have built a complete auction simulator. Um, so we can actually ask you know, exactly what happens as I change the SAT solver. Um, and then re I rerun this thing many times with paired valuations, and I can look at what happens. So what we've got here is, I think, 20 simulations, each with exactly the same bidder valuations. So I've got the same bidder valuations, and I run them four times using uh, the greedy feasibility checker. That's the one that solves 97% of the instances and calls everything else unsatisfiable. Um, Garobi, which was our best mixed integer programming solver. Um, PicoSat, which was a single SAT solver that in the first kind of eight months of working on the project, I recommended to people as looking pretty good and a bunch of the literature therefore uses uh, because that's sort of the, the public disclosure we made at that point. Um, and then SATFC 2.3.1, which is the thing that we actually ran in the auction. And I'm scoring this on two dimensions. Value loss is uh, how much value did, um, how much economic value did we take off the airways? Um, so this is sort of a measure of efficiency. Uh, the more traditional measure of efficiency would be how much value is still on the airways. Um, that's a, 
that's a misleading measure because if one station has a really enormous value in New York and we let it stay on the airways, then that, that just distorts everything by a constant. So, so it's easier in terms of efficiency, if you think about it, to look at how much value gets taken off. What's the sort of additive difference from, from where we started uh, under these different mechanisms? And uh, on the y-axis here, I'm saying cost. How much did the FCC actually have to pay to make this thing happen? And obviously, what the FCC would like is to be sort of close to this corner here, where they have to pay nothing, and they destroy no economic value by repacking the spectrum. Now, they know that they can't do that because they're clearing a bunch of spectrum, and, and you know, that, the repacking is not feasible with everybody staying on the air. So somebody has to go off the air. That's going to cause some value loss. And those stations are going to have to be paid, which is going to cause some cost. Uh, we don't know what the optimum is. The optimum would be VCG, which we can't solve. We actually tried, you know, even given just weeks and weeks of machine time, you, know, you, can't, you can't offline solve the VCG allocation here. It's a mixed integer program, and it's terrible. Um, but what we can say is um, things get progressively better on both measures as we make the sat solver better. And I have to say, you know, we did this after the auction was over. We did not know how this was going to turn out. And this is my wildest dream for what this graph might have looked like. Um, it, it was not, there's no reason to think that we were going to get better by both measures in a statistically significant way as we move from one solver to the next to the next to the next. Uh, that, that's a really phenomenal result. Uh, it just sort of worked out that way. Um, you know, uh, it's nice to see that this is different from this. Um, it's particularly nice to me to see that this is different from this because that's sort of my personal uh, impact on this auction. Um, but it's, it's also pretty cool to see that um, you know, all the fancy ideas are better than you know, the best single SAT solver that, that we knew about at some point. Um, you know, it, it really goes to show that we're both creating more economic value and also saving the government money at the same time. So. Um, so I think overall, this is uh, the single highest uh, dollar value application of SAT solving that, that has ever happened in the world. Because you know, this really created uh, billions of dollars of economic value and simultaneously saved the government billions of dollars in payments um, just by doing better computer science. So isn't that cool? <laughs> uh, and that's a graphical depiction of what I just said. Um, so I'll conclude. Um, so I've told you, first of all, about this socially important problem of spectrum repacking um, that I, was pretty interesting from an auction theory perspective, thinking about what the property rights should be, think about how to capture externalities and how much a good to trade, um, how to ultimately be computationally tractable, find a mechanism that works here. Um, this was used by the FCC in, in descending auctions to buy back radio spectrum from TV broadcasters. Um, which was great, except it gave rise to the need to solve 100,000 MP complete problems over the course of about a year. Um, and uh, I described how we, we were able to do this in a national scale by using some really generalizable tools that I hope you know, many of you will think about how to use in other domains. So thanks for your attention. People have to leave, I can understand it. It's you know, part of the constraint. But if you have questions, you can turn them over. Well, how did they do the, the uh, radio broadcast uh, buyback? Did they use a descending auction, or did they use something? How did they do which? When they, when they auctioned out the radio spectrum before? How did they, what did they do? Well, so they did a forward auction. So they did ascending. So, so all of the previous radio spectrum auctions were basically like, we just have a bunch of radio spectrum that nobody's using for anything. And cell phone companies keep you know, showing up at our office and saying they want some radio spectrum. We don't know who to give it to, so why don't we sell it just as a way of figuring it out. Oh my god, we just made $40 billion. That's, that's basically what happened in the mid-90s. And then all these governments around the world, uh, and Paul Milgram actually was uh, you know, the guy who designed the auction that got used there. Um, he's considered to be on the short list for a Nobel Prize one of these days. You know, we're all crossing our fingers. Didn't happen this year. Um, but uh, you know, that, that was this first kind of revolutionary, like, oh my god, we should be using auctions for this. And countries all around the world did this. They're basically saying, like, we have you know, this color of light that nobody is using for anything, and we can sell it to people, and they'll give us money. Um, but at some point, you run out of colors of light. right? At some point, you've just allocated all of the usable spectrum. And, and that's basically where this stuff kicks in. So, so this was really thinking about, what, what about the world where you've already sold it all off once? Yeah, so I'm just curious. So you mentioned this is 
uh, the first uh, place where this, this idea of a descending auction was, was introduced. And it's certainly not the only descending auction in the world. I mean, oh, okay. Is, uh, descending auctions get used for all kinds of things. Um, oh, I, I'm the only descending auction kind of of this form. I, I could tell you um, what may, you know, I have many bidders. Uh, there's a combinatorial constraint on the seller side about which bidders can be accepted. So where, what, sorry, just, just so I get a sense, where are other contexts where descending auctions are applied? So, so they're often used for like a request for quote. So let's say, you know, I want to um, get my kitchen remodeled. So I get a bunch of, uh, you know, contractors to come in and I say, how much is it, you know, what are you going to be able to do? And I'm going to pick the lowest bid. Right. That's an auction. Right. And if I do it in an open outcry, if they all kind of gather together in my kitchen, you know, it's like 20,000, 18,000, 15,000, back to you, okay, 12,000, you know, that's a reverse auction. And, and, and this, this kind of thing happens in procurement, like so companies that are doing sure. you know, big procurements, you know, this sort of RFQ. Or governments sort of have auctions. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. But typically, you know, what, what makes those auctions simple is you don't have complicated constraints. It's just like one guy's going to remodel my kitchen. So I don't have something like, you know, well, if you do the sink, that means you can't do the dishwasher anymore. Right. You know, that, that starts putting us into this kind of crazy world. I see. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. So, you're taking a CSP, constraint satisfaction problem, and translating it to SAT, and solving it in SAT solvers. It seems to me you're throwing away a lot of structure when you do that, and, and yet clearly wins to use the SAT solver versus class. Is it just because there's about 100 times more effort going into the design of SAT solvers than CSP solvers? Or yes. Is that the only I, I, Well, I mean, we don't know, right? But yeah. um, SAT, I, I guess, you know, one. One thing is that SAT solvers have just received a lot of very specialized study. There's a really healthy community around them. You know, every year, new solver ideas show up in SAT competition. There's this great competition culture that incentivizes the publication of ideas, you know, the production of open source software. There's really nothing else like it in the heuristic algorithms community. And I think that just has led to really steady improvements over time in SAT solving that we haven't seen elsewhere. Um, so, so in part, I think it's this kind of cultural thing. In part, I think SAT is really easy to reason about because everything is Boolean. And so you, know, you can come up with very, very optimized, clever ideas, you know, reasoning in this Boolean setting that if we were smarter than we are, we might be able to do it in a multivariate kind of setting, but we, just, we haven't been as successful at coming up with really, really clever propagation techniques. But you know, many of these really clever propagation techniques kind of ground out to something that we know how to do in SAT. Questions? Yeah. And do you do this through allocation every 10 years or every 50 years? No, it will never happen again. <laughs> and so that's it. Um, this whole thing was a fruitless endeavor that happened once. And I, it's actually not clear how much you know, something like this will ever happen again. I mean, we really resold it. Like, the result of this is that half the TV stations in the United States are no longer broadcasters. You know, they can still um, broadcast over cable into people's homes. Um, they can broadcast over the internet, but they're no longer broadcasting over the airwaves. And that's it, they're not doing it anymore. Um, other countries, um, in many cases, don't have the weird property rights that the US has. They could just do confiscation much more directly. Um, so there are some places where, where this might be useful. I think the UK, this might be useful. Um, but, but it's not um, a, a super general problem. Um, I think more broadly, this kind of notion of procurement and redistribution under combinatorial constraints you know, will surely arise elsewhere. Um, the reverse auction design by itself, I think, might, might arise in contexts where I'm just doing some kind of complicated procurement under design constraints. And the coolest one that I've heard about is the Nature Conservancy, which is a, a, a large um, uh, ecological charity. Um, pays farmers to delay harvesting crops on their fields uh, by a couple of weeks in order to provide habitat for migratory birds. So they want to ensure that as the birds are migrating south from Canada down to Mexico, that they have places to land every night. And so they, you know, for the farmers, it's a little bit worse to, ha to harvest late, but it's not that much worse, and so they pay them something. And they, have, uh, they, they, they do it right now in a terrible way. Um, and what they should do is, they use an auction, it's a really crazy auction, but they, they should use a better auction. And if they use the better auction, um, there are combinatorial constraints because uh, it's, not, it's not quite the same as this, but um, 
if I buy out your field, I really don't want to buy out your neighbor's field because I've already covered those migratory birds. So I want to have kind of zones of exclusion around the fields that I buy out. So this is a kind of a set cover problem. Um, and uh, I, uh, th that's again, you know, the farmer's just going to get paid or not. I can have these very simple binary decisions being made by the farmers. I have this sort of um, combinatorial constraint in the back end, which is now is a set cover problem. Um, and this you know, really tells me how to, how to solve that kind of problem. Um, I, I mentioned this to the Nature Conservancy uh, people, and uh, they just weren't interested in even having a conversation too late for them. Um, maybe they'll come around at some point. Um, I actually met their chairwoman um, while she was waiting to meet Obama at the hotel that I was staying at in Hawaii that Obama coincidentally showed up at. Um, but she had her mind on other things. Um, so too bad, we never got anywhere. But, but this just goes to show like there, there are very, very different kinds of procurement settings where, where this kind of approach could be useful. But uh, you know, it's all about finding the right partnership. Yeah. A question related to Elm. So imagine that finding the set encoding is, there's lots of common, lots of choices in the set encodings that might make. Fewer than you might think. We ended up doing something pretty, pretty direct. Uh, we played a little bit with set encodings, but um, we were never very clever there. Uh, you, you could imagine that being clever there would be helpful. Um, we didn't really end up squeezing that part of the lemon very hard, and it, it, it's hard to know how much upside there is, but certainly there are some problems where there are a bunch of canonical encodings, and there are variations on these encodings about just how far do you enroll something, and how many new synthetic variables do you make up, and that's certainly very consistent with this kind of framework. One more question? Yeah. On the level of the scientific community, um, how old do you think is the, this idea of deep optimization that you explained propagating in the community? Can, can we expect this to be, become a major boom, or is it already, or is it still niche? Well, I mean, you know, compared to deep learning, everything's niche. Computer science is niche. What do you want? Uh, it's, uh, it's got pretty high uptake. I mean, the, the paper that introduced SMAC has got, I don't know, Six or seven hundred citations at this point. Like it's definitely something people are using substantially. Um, you know, I, I think the really interesting question is why optimization hasn't taken off. You know, heuristic optimization hasn't taken off more than it has as compared to machine learning. Um, you know, leave aside what method you use for doing optimization. Why are people just less concerned about optimization than you know I feel like they should be? Um, I think it's because you need you know, very clean digital inputs, and you need some kind of autonomous digital system that can act on the results of the optimization uh, in order for optimization to be very important. And I think right now we're at a stage where just getting everything into a computer in a meaningful way, making some kind of decent semantic sense of a real system in a computer is just pretty hard to do at all. And I think machine learning is really about that kind of ingestion problem. It's just about getting computers to reason in a sensible way about the real world. I think. I think ultimately machine learning will enable optimization to be more important than it has been historically. I think as we get better and better at getting everything digital and being able to reason internally about these things, we're inevitably going to want more and more to be doing a better job with the optimization problem. So I think um, this stuff will become more and more relevant over time. Um, and I think as it does, um, surely some kind of automated methods for, for constructing optimization algorithms are going to make sense. So, um, you know, I think. You know, we're seeing the, the AutoML uh, literature is really um, thinking about the application of these same kinds of methods to the design of machine learning algorithms. You know, that's become a bit of a boom in the last few years. So I think this stuff is taking off, but I think it's still got some upside yet to come. Thanks, everyone, for your so, attention. Yeah, I would just want to say a couple of words. I think this, I mean, Canada is the center for AI decision-making and action. This strikes me the kind of work we've heard Kevin describe here. It's just paradigmatic of the kind of work we want to see working on a really important problem in the real world, but with well-founded theory and experimental course. So thank you for a great talk.